Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome uh, to this very important uh, webinar. My name is uh, Masood Salim Mohammed, and uh, I am your uh, Deputy Secretary General, honored to be hosting you along with uh, our dear President uh, Bernard Ondo. Um, allow me to begin by thanking each and every one of you uh, for making time out of your very busy schedule uh, to be with us. This is one of the um, Young Lawyers uh, Mentorship Series, and specifically today, uh, we're focusing on the topic uh, moving from good to best, uh, lessons on developing outstanding law uh, practices. Um, and to speak a little bit personally, this is a topic that is very close and dear to my heart because uh, throughout uh, East Africa Law Society's uh, meeting, I've always uh, advocated for greater uh, mentorship, greater uh, empowerment program for us young lawyers and all young uh, professionals out there. So first of all, Big thank you to um, the um, uh, Secretariat. But big thank you for the great panel that we have. And these are people who are really, really busy. Some of the best uh, legal minds in East Africa uh, for setting, uh, making time uh, to be with us here, to inspire and empower uh, young lawyers in, in East Africa. And really this series, and including today's event, aim at empowering young lawyers, uh, sharing experience with our, our peers, and getting to learn and getting that inspiration uh, from senior counsels who've been everywhere and everything we're trying to do now, uh, they have done it. And so we cannot thank you enough, uh, panel, and we cannot thank you enough, uh, Secretariat, uh, for putting this uh, uh, together. Now, um, as I said, I'll be co-hosting you along with our president, uh, Bernard Oundo. And um, we do have um, the profiles of all our panelists. Um, and as I'll be welcoming uh, different speakers, I'll do a little intro, uh, all keeping in mind the best interest of time. We don't really have much uh, time and I'd rather we hear more from them and later you have uh, time in the plenary and Q&A session uh, to raise issues, to give your comments, uh, rather than this being a one-way uh, one traffic. And with that and the permission from my co-host, uh, President Undo, let me take you through um, our program uh, for this afternoon. So, our first item on the program, and I believe you all have received a copy of the program, but if not, I'm reading the program to you. First item is what I'm doing now, the welcome and um, introductions. And then this will be followed um, to uh, 10 to 220 by opening remarks for our president. Uh, so Mr. President, get ready because when I'm done talking, we'll hear uh, opening remarks from you. Uh, after opening remarks, we will hear uh, from uh, David Mpanga, whom I'll introduce um, when his time is due uh, to, to take um, the floor. Um, and David, th this, uh, this series and this webinar has been designed uh, in a way that the young lawyers, you really get the maximum uh, out of it. So after uh, the keynote uh, speech from David Mpanga, uh, we will hear from uh, Richard Mogisha, former president, who will be talking about uh, making the decision to go independent. Um, then after that, uh, we will hear from Ambassador Monaidi Sinaw Majar on how to select a partner. This is crucial as we start off. Um, after uh, Ambassador Monaidi, I uh, will hear from none other than uh, Omar Said Shaban, who will talk about how do you get 
those clients on board uh, as a beginner. And I think for us young lawyer, this is very uh, critical. Um, we will then uh, move on. And for an interesting topic on uh, structuring the practice towards uh, a commercial enterprise, um, we will hear from Claver uh, Nig Nigarura, uh, who will take us uh, through that topic. Um, and then we will hear on budgeting and other financial matters. Uh, we all know sometimes as lawyers, we have uh, issues or we just think that we are not good at budgeting and finances and we're all just about the sections of the law, but it doesn't have to be that. We need to know our accounts, we need to know our numbers so we can remain viable in this very uh, competitive uh, uh, market. Um, that will take us to uh, 3.30. And from 3.30 to 4, we'll have a plenary uh, discussion and Q&A. Uh, that will be chaired by uh, the president uh, and myself again. And just the topic before last on budgeting and other financial matters, that will be presented by none other than Harriet Chigai, uh, that most young lawyers know because she was the founder of the position that uh, I hold uh, uh, today. Uh, she, she was a pioneer. Um, and uh, some of the panelists will have presentations, but we have a technical team on hand and they'll be sharing those presentations uh, as uh, the meeting goes, but also afterwards. And uh, well, without further ado, once again, welcome, Karibuni Sana, everyone. And allow me now to introduce our very uh, capable uh, president, uh, Bernard Ondo, for uh, your opening remarks. Karibu, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Thank you so much for this opportunity. On behalf of the Governing Council, and indeed on my own behalf, I'd like to welcome you all to this Young Lawyers webinar series. Uh, we are going to focus on mentoring young lawyers during uh, this two year tenure that you have been, that you have given us to lead the East African Law Society. It's going to be one of the critical issues that we are going to focus on. And I believe that the panelists that we have assembled today will inspire you and help build your law practices better and also share thoughts on how the legal profession is growing. It's very important to the East Africa Law Society because 70% of our membership is actually young lawyers. Myself, I'm looking forward to this presentation. And without further ado, let me hand back to the moderator and then we'll be able to come back during the question and answer session. Thank you so much. And let me also thank the panelists for sparing their time to come and share their stories. Thank you again. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, for um, very short and brief, really brief remarks. Um, now, uh, next we'll be uh, hearing from our keynote um, our speaker, uh, David Mpanga. Now, uh, to our participants everywhere in East Africa and beyond, I uh, just wanted to remind you that um, the profiles of our panelists have been shared. Um, and so I will not go through uh, the profile. So we uh, focus the time on hearing from the people, the actual people who are here with us. But just, just a brief one, uh, David Mpanga is a, a partner at Bowman's Kampala office. Uh, he's a barrister of the Honorable Society of uh, the Middle uh, Temple. He specializes on commercial transactions, has an interest in um, public interest litigation and human rights issues, just among many other interests. Uh, Karibu Sana, uh, David, the floor is yours. Inspire Young Lawyers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know whether to start with uh, the moderator, Masood, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, it might be a breach of protocol if I don't go with the president first. So, Mr. President, please forgive me if I first honor the person who's invited me to the stage. 
It's also very kind of you to invite me uh, on this august occasion to talk to young lawyers and hopefully inspire rather than uh, uh, depress them because it is possible to be a great lawyer uh, and the difference between what is good and what is great is, 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 is pretty small. Um, you said about us initially, uh, Mr. Secretary General and moderator today, that we've been everywhere. Um, I've been to many places, but I still haven't been to Zanzibar, so that's a challenge for me. Um, and uh, as far as East Africa Law Society, I think I've been to every jurisdiction. So uh, good afternoon, everybody from everywhere. I hope we have a representative section uh, of members of the East Africa Law Society and the East African Bar. Um, I'd also like to thank you very much for not uh, sparing me the profile that you were sent. Um, that profile is prepared by our business development team. Um, every time I've heard it read, I kind of think that I'm attending my own funeral. Um, you kind of hear all these things being said about you. Um, and usually uh, those things are said when you're gone. So it's uh, less embarrassing when, they, when you kind of just leave it to people to read. But I'm David Mpanga. I'm a lawyer. Um, I've been practicing 26 years. 37 years. I was called to the bar in 1993. Um, believe you me, uh, young brothers and sisters, 26, 27 years flies by. If you don't believe me, ask the presidents of East Africa. They'll tell you um, that uh, 35 years is nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a short time. It flies by. It flies by, and I still feel, in many ways, a young lawyer. But I know now that I'm, I'm on the senior side. And having turned 50 this year, I think I can also say that I'm in the senior uh, section of society as well. Um, I prepared a very short uh, presentation. Um, if we could go to the next slide, just helping you understand moving from good to best or moving from good to great. Um, and the first thing I thought we would talk about would be understanding that legal practice law is not an academic subject. Legal practice is a business the colleagues will talk about that. But I think if you're going to understand what it is that separates a good lawyer from a great lawyer, you need to understand the secret that law is a tool for risk management and problem solving. It's not an academic subject. It's not a dead uh, thing that you go to um, and kind of get some oracle, like you know, visiting the ancestors and get some whispering uh, of what the answer might be as the wind rushes through the trees. It is a tool, a living tool for risk management and problem solving. If you understand that, your clients come to you to understand documents they have to sign uh, by way of contracts, undertakings they have to make um, to understand how they can get their business to move in a way that is compliant with the law. Or if there's a problem, to resolve that problem that has arisen with the law. You'll understand that law is only a tool. They come to you to understand how they can use that tool to better their business. Not to get a lecture on, oh, that's very interesting. Uh, in the case of Carlyle and Carbolic Smoke Book uh, and the citation for that, because you remember it. Um, and you remember that in Keen on Evidence, there is a provision in a certain uh, section of the Evidence Act, and it's very well written. I mean, all these things might tickle you uh, and when you've just come out of university, really be of interest to you but a great lawyer knows that those things are only really of interest to them. Um, the client wants a solution, wants a problem solved, or wants their, man their risk understood and managed. So the great lawyer is actually the lawyer who is very nearly a business person, or very nearly, very close to understanding what their client needs, because their, your client doesn't want to visit your offices frequently. Your client doesn't want to be in regular touch with you. When I talk to my young associates here, I tell them of all of us having to face uh, this terrible thing called death. And from time to time, we have our undertakers whom we go to, our funeral service directors, whom we go to for the service because they have to help us. Granny has died. Uh, mother or father, auntie has died. Sadly, sometimes colleague has died. Um, but the funny thing is we shortly after that have big parties. We have weddings, we have graduation parties, we have birthday parties for the kids. We never ever invite the funeral director to those parties. There's a reason why. We associate the funeral director with the problem. See, that person might be very good in delivering a good service uh, and grandma was seen off in you know, pomp and ceremony and everything was fine. But we never think, oh, this is a you know, junior's graduation. 
let's invite the funeral director to come. In fact, when you see the funeral director outside the funeral arrangement, you're scared of them. Now, the lawyer shouldn't get to that point, is always my concern, that you shouldn't become part of the client's problem. You shouldn't be identified with the problem. You should be on the problem solving side of things. And that's why frequently we invite our doctors. Um, the doctor is viewed to be the person who helps you manage health and brings you back to health. Even the doctor who sadly manages situations where people don't recover, we still kind of associate them with the solution. So a good lawyer may understand law, may know law academically, may be able to risk manage. A great lawyer understands and uses law as a tool to manage their client's risk and resolve their problems cost effectively and quickly. Um, I think the next point would be, well, how do you then get into law? Do you get in as an amateur generalist? When most of us started practice in East Africa, you could do everything in one day. You'd write a will, uh, go to the criminal court. In the afternoon, you're drafting a mining contract. And in the evening, you're reviewing memorandum and articles of association of a, of a bank or something else. You'd have a small holders boundary dispute in the morning, a, you know, all sorts of things. And you're kind of running around, touching things, scratching various surfaces but never really specializing. I think the age of the amateur generalist was great, uh, but has come to an end. Um, in the bigger and more advanced economies, uh, scale enables lawyers to specialize. And you will find lawyers who will tell you that ever since I left law school, I've done sales of good, international sale of goods contracts. And in fact, I've gone into international sale of goods contract I, I, I focus on Romalpa clauses in, in those contracts. And then one time, one person will even tell you, yes, I specialize in Romalpa clauses in those contracts on the buyer side. I specialize in Romalpa clauses on the seller side, et cetera, et cetera. Hyper specialization exists and is tenable in the larger, in the larger economies. We may not be able to hyper specialize, but we certainly are also not going to be able to succeed and be great lawyers on a generalist basis because there's things that we'll only see once in a season. There are not enough of those things for us to be able uh, to keep juggling balls in the air. And if we let go of our insecurity, because many times it's an insecurity, makes you think that you have to try everything. When the client comes along and says, I've got this, you say, oh, bring it. And then I've got the other. Because you're scared that if you turn away that work, you won't have the fees. We need to be bold and be able to say, let me try a few things, but let me start categorizing the things that I can do, the things that I have seen before, the things that I can do more effectively, the things where I can be more efficient in risk management or problem solving, and maybe spend the downtime researching and perfecting that other instruction, rather than taking on something new in a completely new area where you have to spend so many hours learning. And slowly that specialization will begin to uh, reward you and will enable you to become great in that field. All of this, I say with a caveat on generalism versus specialization. We've learned many things, and I think one of the things that we've learned in this pandemic has been the fact that actually the agile are the people who will survive. So in everything that I talk about, be agile. Be ready to learn, unlearn, and learn again is the best way of putting it. Um, you might be on the way to specializing in a particular area, and that particular area might be dependent on a particular thing happening in the economy. Oil and gas. There was a time when everybody in Kampala was studying oil and gas and was going off to do an oil and gas degree or was find, trying to find clients in the oil and gas space. was you know the boom that was just about to happen, and everybody got their suits on, ready to jump on that boom. And that boom didn't go bust, but the boom just kind of kept moving further down the horizon and then slightly disappeared, suddenly disappeared. What happened to the oil and gas lawyers? Some of them became projects lawyers doing renewable energy projects, which were bubbling away, but you know, people hadn't realized that maybe the same kinds of skill uh, set that you need for oil and gas can be applied to energy, other energy uh, projects. Some became uh, you know, corporate lawyers using some of their, their skills, skill set that they developed in oil and understanding oil and gas 
to just be, uh, I think just to be corporate lawyers. The critical thing was you needed to know that I'm on a hiding to something and then also be able to understand that I'm now on a hiding to nothing. Um, there's some who waited for oil and gas and it didn't come and it passed them by. Um, there are others who you know, hyper-specialized in advance and it went to people who hadn't specialized in it, but they now have specialized on the job. So I think agility is a very key thing as you choose your specialization. Learn to discern the things that you love, that you've chosen, but also be able to see the thing that chooses you, you see. Um, if I make it my own experience, when I came out of law school, when I went into law school, I was dying to be a top end corporate lawyer in London, in, cham in, in chambers in London, top end corporate barrister. Um, I didn't get in on account of a whole host of things. And the cha chambers I got into trained me to be a general commercial, a general common law lawyer with a slant to professional malpractice. I didn't get in. Uh, as a permanent tenant in those chambers, and I got an opportunity to be a white collar crime lawyer um, practicing uh, in a specialized white collar crime uh, uh, barrister's set. I came back to Uganda, and there was a unity of profession, a unified profession, so there no no division between solicitors and barristers. And I became a corporate lawyer, doing court work, um, and eventually specializing in the areas that I was specialized in. The thing that I chose didn't choose me, it didn't accept me. The things that I kind of accidentally landed on chose me and pulled me into their, into their field. Know when the field of gravity is pulling you, sometimes it's taking you to bigger things, better things, and don't keep banging on doors that are closed. So I think agility is a very critical part. Critical part. I move to my next point, swiftly. In the way that I've been talking about uh, the advanced economies and uh, perhaps less advanced economies such as ours uh, and less specialized economies, we need to understand that we are now in a world that sometimes people call a global village. We're interconnected, heavily interconnected, and our competition is no longer just the guy who was or the girl who was in the next row from us at university or in law school. Uh, our competition isn't just the law firm down the road or above us in the commercial building we're letting. Our competition is truly global. And our global competition doesn't sleep. There's a lawyer in Japan right now doing work that you could have been doing. There's a lawyer in Alaska or on the other side in California who's sleeping, getting ready to wake up to look for the work that you are in your time zone right now maybe not realizing that you should be doing or not doing to the best of your capacity. Our competition is global. There are students, there are young lawyers out there in all jurisdictions who can now do the things that you're doing better, faster, cheaper, more effectively, they're closer to the clients that we're all looking for. And so we must be on our game 100%, 100%. Um, if you consider yourself to be protected by your borders, protected by your law society or your law council or whatever regulation you think keeps you insulated from the forces of market competition, wake up my brother and my young sister, this is not a game. The competition is global and the competition doesn't sleep. Which leads me neatly to my next point about how to make your practice Google and AI proof. Uh, all lawyers, the lawyers I was talking about in America, in, in, in San Francisco, and everywhere in between London, have Google. And all of them have managed to persuade our law societies and various centers of academia to put all our laws and everything online. All these things are now researchable online. There are resources that you can pay for, many which are free, which enable you to access the laws of Tanzania, the laws of Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi. South Sudan, find them, get all the judgments, read them, and internalize them for yourself. So the lawyer who is going to survive, the actual lawyer who is going to do well, and not just going to be a filing post for external counsel coming from other countries, is actually the lawyer who is Google and AI proof. AI, all of you know that there are now programs that write contracts, that research law, there are programs that can actually even second, ju second guess judges. I don't know if you know that. You can do a due diligence for a large organization 
using document uh, a program that can read contracts, that can tell you everything that you need to know about the, the conditions precedent, the various uh, warranties and conditions, and give you a good due diligence report. AI, these things used to be done by associates or young lawyers and candidate uh, attorneys, young trainees. These things can now be done by computers. So how do you Google proof and AI proof your practice? You must understand the interaction, the local interaction of your law with your business. That is what people will be paying for lawyers. Coming back, it kind of connects back to the first point about law as a tool for risk management and problem solving. You must be connected to a particular market in a unique way, in a unique unreproduction, you know, un undigitizable way. And I'm not just saying knowing the ED or knowing the general counsel of a particular uh, entity or knowing the judge so you can slip them a kitu kidogo. Uh, you know, if that's your thing, do it. Um, more, more importantly, you must understand the, 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 those little gaps that machine learning can't get into. I think that's really where that arbitrage in the future is going to be where we're at. Because otherwise, a lawyer in Kenya will sit and do work that could have been done by a lawyer in Zambia, a lawyer in Tanzania. But the lawyer in South Africa can also do the same for work in East Africa. So get into the global competition game, understand how you can do work outside your own territory, understand that people are competing for you and for the work that you're looking for, but find ways of making yourself humanly in indispensable. Anything that can be replicated, anything that can be reduced to binary, ones and notes, will be reduced and will go, all right? Uh, professionalism, ethics, and integrity is one of the key things that a great lawyer has over and above a good lawyer. Uh, and by professionalism, I start with good customer care and understanding that you're problem solving, that you're managing somebody's legal risk, but you are actually their servant, all right? You are, if I may put it crudely, a parasite. You're not the person that is creating the value. You're helping the people who are creating the value. So people who rear cows will know when I say that, when I use this analogy, um, that any country in which you find ticks that are bigger than cattle, you know that there'll be very few cattle in that country, in that place. A tick just takes a little bit of blood, swells up, but leaves the cow to thrive so that it may get more blood the next day. Uh, a, a, a tick that eats its host and kills it is a foolish is a foolish parasite, a foolish tick. Lawyers must be the same. Please don't go around and say, Mr. Mpanga said lawyers are parasites. We're not, we're value adding people and we're great. But I was just <laughs> I was using a, an analogy that would help you understand that you're supposed to be helping your client grow, not growing at your client's expense. You're supposed to be helping your client do their thing and do it better so that you may grow and be bigger and get more clients. So one tick goes to many cows. So there'll be a bigger cow population, all right? Rather than you being the one tick uh, that sucks all the cattle. So there's only one cow and there are many of you ticks. Um, you'll end up with a cannibalistic uh, situation. Professionalism requires us to be servicing our clients, to be ahead of our clients in terms of correspondence, to keep them informed to be ethical, uh, highly ethical, honest, uh, and to always, always manifest integrity. Confidentiality, um, you find many times that clients come to people and say, I want to use you as opposed to all the other lawyers in the directory because nothing that I've ever done with you have I heard in the market when I was out there. You're not in competition with me in the market. Um, so they'll, they'll bring you their idea and say, how do we bring this idea to life? In, in with, with, with legal risk managed, um, licensing and the other things complied with. They know that you're going to be a person, a trusted advisor, right? So professionalism is very key in moving you from that just a good lawyer to a great lawyer. Lastly, um, patience. Patience, as I say, is a virtue. Now, many of you in this day and age will be able to communicate directly with uh, the richest man in the world. You can put uh, Bill Gates on Twitter and communicate with him. You can communicate with Zuckerberg on, 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 on uh, Facebook. You can 
at your your president in your and I'm not just talking about Bernardo Uno, I'm talking about your the real presidents, the one that went house and you know things um, on social media. And, and, and that technology has made it look like we are more level and has also made a situation where interactions are faster, looser, and therefore you can build your brand quickly. Um, you can project uh, a certain brand as the lawyer on social media, on the internet. You can put up a good website and you know have be beautiful pictures from stock uh, photo libraries of, of, of panels, panels of books and wood, oak paneled offices, etc. So you can project yourself beyond what you actually can deliver. And I think that is the biggest trap for any lawyer who's trying to get from the good part into the great part. It still takes time. You will not be able to short circuit experience. You'll be able, of course, you don't have to go around reinventing every wheel. You can do research much quicker. You can deliver services you know, easier and better using these tools. But always remember that patience is still a virtue. Don't over promise when you can't yet deliver. Promise what you can deliver. It will give you a better and more sustainable return on what you're doing and also build you to the next. So when you see Mr. Mgisha and he looks young and he's driving a big, uh, I don't know what car he drives, I won't say, uh, you know, the, 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 car, the car of your dreams. That car was the car of his dreams when he was 25. He's driving it now. Um, the brand new car, the first time I ever drove a brand new car, I was 43. Um, you know, it, it says many things, but my priority might not have been the big brand new car. But when I could afford it, when all the other things had been done, I decided to get myself a brand new car um, because I could. And I did it without stealing from anybody. We go back to ethics and integrity. I did it without cheating anyone in terms of uh, saying I'll do something, taking an advance fee and not paying it. And I did it in a way that kind of befitted uh, the stage of my profession and the stage of my life, the life that I was in. It's very, very important. And I think the biggest pitfall, if I can say, uh, that I've witnessed for young lawyers in that advancement from good to great has been the good promising young lawyer falling off the lawyer who's just about to make it into the great category, falling off because they were not patient, because they wanted the opportunity that was not yet theirs, because they went for the thing uh, that they thought they could do, bit off more than they could chew, and were exposed. And clients just said, well, talk's a good game, it's not very good. Um, with those few words, I think Mr. Chair, Mr. President and Mr. Secretary General, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, those are my thoughts, and I'd, like, I'd be happy to take some questions much later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, David. That was brilliant and uh, um, really inspiring. Um, if, if I were to make a couple of comments, there are other questions that I would take as take away from your presentation. Uh, and it is, how do I go from a good to a great lawyer? How do I create value? Uh, how do I add value uh, you know, to my client's business? Um, how do I become humanly indispensable? And how do I turn my practice into a business? That's what is going through my mind. Uh, but we'll hear from the participants uh, later on. Thank you very, very much. That was really brilliant. And um, so next, uh, to take us on an equally uh, important topic, uh, making the decision to go independent. Um, this will be covered by our very own uh, former president of East Africa Law Society uh, that very many of us have had uh, uh, the opportunity to work with, uh, Mr. Richard uh, Mugisha. Uh, Mr. Richard Mugisha um, practices uh, in Rwanda. And uh, like the previous speaker, uh, Mr. Mugisha has got many, many accolades, including he's been cited by the chambers and partners as a band one attorney and the go-to lawyer and a great uh, negotiator. 
I think that is what David was talking about. How, how do you make, how do we make ourselves indispensable? Mr. Former President, Karibu Sana, uh, young lawyers all over East Africa are ready to hear from you. You have 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you uh, President Owundo and thank you Deputy SG for the introduction. Um, this is a, a, a fairly interesting uh, subject uh, in the sense that uh, I'm not sure that I was very intentional about uh, deciding when to go in independent. Um, uh, and, and probably a lot of things were happening to me unconsciously. But as I was thinking about, about um, what to share with you today, I felt that it was important to sort of retrace my steps. And um, I think uh, I've come up with a few questions that everyone uh, who is considering going into private practice should answer to themselves. It is very important to have um, a conversation with yourself so that you get uh, the right answers, uh, knowing that uh, starting um, illegal practice is in many respects a lifetime commitment you go into it for the long haul. Uh, it's not uh, the kind of thing you do to address temporary cash flow issues. If you go uh, into it with that kind of attitude, for sure it's not going to work. And so here are a few questions that I think uh, everyone who is preferably in a, a job setting, but wishes to go independent, should ask themselves and answer. So the first question that I think uh, is critical is, what is that aspect of your career that you're earning for, but which your current occupation does not give you? That is important because uh, Legal practice uh, should be uh, one of those things in your life that uh, uh, contribute to your self-actualization. So uh, one of the things that um, there's a misconception about, uh, uh, you know, legal practice being one that uh, that offers you financial independence. And for many uh, young lawyers, that is the only consideration. But there is much more to this. Again, uh, uh, taking this as, a, as a, uh, something you do for the long haul, as a lifetime commitment, you've got to remain incentivized even when uh, business is going slow. And the, 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 the surest way of remaining incentivized is to be able to satisfy yourself that you're adding value to your career. So uh, you need to be very clear about what it is that you think you're not getting in your current um, role, but which would be seri uh, materially enhanced once you go independent. Uh, the second question that you have to ask yourself is, uh, are you confident uh, that you have done the necessary investment in yourself and therefore ready to go to the market? Uh, I think uh, this will probably tie into what uh, David just shared with us earlier on, uh, in the sense that you have to be able to offer something to the market. And it's important to think about it. What are those things that you think you have invested time and effort in and are therefore ready to offer it to the market? 
Uh, the third question to ask oneself is that uh, what um, have you been doing in terms of building your social capital? Uh, because uh, this business is very much about uh, about people, about networks, and you have to be intentional about uh, ensuring that your network is ever expanding. You've got people that support you who have an interest in, 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 in your growth and who see in you as um, value, um, of, of, of someone who adds value to their to their lives and businesses. So you need to ask yourself this question: Is am I uh, have I reached a point where I've got the requisite social capital that will support me through this journey? The fourth question you should ask yourself uh, as you consider going to in independent is: Have you identified a mentor or mentors? to help you uh, embark on this journey because it's going to be uh, uh, a, a constant requirement for you to have those people that uh, have an interest in your growth, to whom you can always uh, bounce off ideas and who you unreservedly know uh, will always root for you. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's always important to have those even uh, before you embark on this journey. Um, the, the fifth question um, is, is your family prepared uh, to accompany you on this journey with all the risks associated? So, um, uh, one day you are in a job, you are earning a thousand or two thousand dollars. And even if you have some savings, uh, there is so much uncertainty as you start your private practice. So it's, it is important to remember that uh, this is a risk like any other. Sometimes you might do well other times it might take a while. And, and I think that's also when uh, you are going to be tested in terms of how much you are incentivized to go in for the long haul, because you don't want to be one of these lawyers who face a few uh, months of uh, a dry spell, and then the next minute they are ready for a job. And one of the ways of ensuring that you um, uh, you are ready to go independent is to have conversations with the people that matter to you, your family, your spouse, so that they are not going to be part of your stress when things are not going well, but would rather be there as people to encourage you uh, on the journey, fully understanding what the risks are and uh, believing in you and supporting you so as you, so that you can get out of um, uh, whatever challenge you're facing at any given point in time. The other thing is that depending on the kind of uh, area of interest uh, you have, you are going to be taking on some very, very risky matters, yeah? which compromise even your own physical security. And therefore, um, you need to have run your family through some of these challenges so that um, they are there, they understand what it is there, but more importantly, uh, they are your family and are ready to support you. Um, The other uh, question that you need to make sure that you have answered in uh, the affirmative is, do you have an understanding of your market? 
do you having scanned it uh, do you feel that you are confident that there is um, an area that you can capitalize on that is aligned with your personal interests where you can add value have you also uh, kept informed of developments outside your jurisdiction, which could have an impact on your market that you have factored into uh, your analysis so that you are just not going to become a statistic. You are actually going to add value to the market. And so a question of, uh, I mean, a, a combination of having clarity about what your heart desires, being realistic about the market conditions, and understanding uh, that your market is not insulated from wider developments outside your jurisdiction is something about which you have to be very clear. Now, uh, sometimes, you may not be able to answer these questions uh, uh, satisfactorily to yourself, but even when you are not able to determine that you are ready, it is important that you keep giving thought to these issues because these are things over which you must get clarity as you go along. So uh, these uh, general uh, uh, comments I, I made, and, and I think it's important to just give you a flavor of what were my own considerations as I started the practice way back in 2004. I had just been, um, I had just been uh, to the US to do my masters and uh, having spent time in New York, uh, I felt that I, I was ready to attempt to do some of the things I've been hearing throughout my stay there. But I was not very clear about which way to go. So my choices were, uh, were between um, taking on a job in an international organization or doing private practice. And I was fortunate to, to be given a, a fellowship by the university I attended to allow me to spend uh, some time at uh, organizations of interest, uh, considering that I was also very interested in things that would impact the African region. So I spent uh, about six months at uh, one, the Comesa Secretariat, where I was interning with uh, the Director of Legal Affairs there. And then I spent... Uh, I you have, uh, two minutes, Mr. President. Yes, and then I, and then I spent uh, um, uh, uh, another three months at the Nepad Secretariat in South Africa. At the end of that period, it was very clear to me that international organizations were not my thing, in fact, I was offered a position at Comesa, which I turned down. And then I knew that my next thing was going to be uh, private practice. Within the area of private practice, um, 2004 was a time when the country was opening up to the rest of the world. Uh, there were privatizations uh, going on. And uh, many of the investors that were looking at this market were coming from Kenya, from the UK, from the United States. At the time, there were very few lawyers in the country that could work well in English. And I knew that that was where I could add value. The, then I engaged my family, of course, and uh, my wife was uh, supportive of what I, I, I was about to embark on. I only had one child at the time, so I didn't have to worry about school fees. 
And then finally, I tried to network with uh, as many people as I could, uh, both locally and uh, elsewhere. And uh, having done that, then I knew I was able to, to launch. And yeah, that is the story uh, that I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, President Mugisha. And uh, I have restrictions on myself on how much I can comment. But I'd say listening to your talk here is like you're sitting and you're hearing. I like the idea about conversations with uh, yourself and people that matter. Uh, it's like uh, getting an advice from uh, a dad who's realistic, strategic, and ready to give you some tough love. So thank you very much. That was uh, brilliant, and I wish I could say more on it, but I'll save time so that uh, at the end, the participants, uh, we can hear more from the participants. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for that. And um, without uh, further ado, uh, we'll go to our next one. Very, very important, uh, selecting a partner. Uh, someone at one of the East African Law Society's meeting once said it was easier for him to find, much easier to find a wife than to find a partner. Some of us think differently, but this is exactly what uh, Ambassador uh, Monaidi Sinar Majar will talk about. Uh, she's uh, highly experienced. She's a partner at uh, Rex, Rex Advocates, uh, based in Dar es Salaam. Uh, she has also served in many distinguished roles, including ambassador uh, representing the United Republic of Tanzania in various uh, jurisdictions. Uh, Balozi Mwanaidi, the floor is yours. Karibu, uh, young lawyers are ready for you. Um, good afternoon. Um, very thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, um, and uh, all the panelists um, protocol observed. I have only 10 minutes, uh, so I don't want to spend my time talking about other things. I have an interesting topic to talk about, which is um, selecting a partner for a law firm. And I know I'm talking to young um, lawyers uh, who may be looking into setting a practice or who already set a practice and they're looking for some little um, comfort from us. Where did time go? I don't know. We, I am one of the founders of the East Africa Law Society. And I, I always feel so proud to see where we have, uh, how we have grown. Uh, sitting at a hotel in Washington, DC, um, um, lawyers from presidents actually from uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania thought, why not? And here we are. So I, I feel very proud about that one. So um, how do you select a partner? Can you move the, 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 the screen, please, into um, partnership, really, in some jurisdictions is um, one that is regulated by contract um, because you are not going to incorporate. In some instance, in some other jurisdictions, it, you can have an incorporated partnership, which has legal person and you can do things. I'm not going to go into that, but what I want you to understand is uh, that a partnership, even when you are an incorporated entity, it is really some form of a um, contractual arrangement between individuals who have one vision and one mission and they want to do business together. So um, that's how I define a partnership. Uh, how do you choose a partner? Uh, next, please, slide. Choosing a partner and what to look for. Choosing a partner is one of the things that you've got to do very carefully. And I also look back to myself at what I have done. The partners that I got together early, those that we had to part company, and those that we stayed all the 35 years I've practiced. Choosing a practicing partner, you're choosing almost another lifetime partner, just like your spouse. 
um, and this partner, you're going to spend more time with that partner than your spouse. This is the paradox of, of our partnership. And you're together most time. At one time, we, we went to, to meet a client and this client uh, looked at me and my partner and he says, oh, so this is Mrs. Rechugura. <laughs> and uh, he went, oh, no, 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 she, it's not. She'll be very mad at me. <laughs> Are you so afraid that I'm your, your spouse? But I want to say that you, you really need to be someone, to pick someone who you will be able to work with for life. Yeah, like uh, spouses, some partners may fall off, but at least you have to choose one that you're going to work with and that you feel happy to be around that person because you will be working with that person all the time. Qualification number one, trust. You've got to trust your partner with your life. The partners I had, and I've been telling young lawyers uh, all along, my very early partners, we had only one signing mandate of all bank accounts. Our firm bank accounts and the class bank accounts. We never had any fear that one will cheat you out. You must have confidence that your partner is going to do th not going to do things behind your back. <clears throat> In a partnership, each partner is responsible for the actions of the other partner. Not even in a, in a marriage that you are responsible for the actions of your husband or wife, but in a partnership you are. That's why you have to have someone who you can trust with your life, is not someone who is going to put you in trouble. A former um, associate working with me now, of course, adult, and he had his own practice, had to quit a practice that he had put together with some young people because they became so untrustworthy uh, one of them is now uh, incarcerated, and the others have to pay money that he took away, which he shouldn't have. So trust, trust is number one. So you must pick someone you know. You're not going to be partner with someone you didn't know. And number two is not necessarily the long experience, but someone smart, someone who has the ability to learn and work, someone who uh, does it, is not scared of working, is not scared of taking on a challenge. Uh, someone who has goodwill, and goodwill is wrapped in so many uh, ways. You have goodwill with clientele, the client contact that you have, goodwill with the community, someone who is respected in his church, in his mosque, in the area where he lives, um, he has goodwill, and, and that goodwill will bring clients. He is someone who people go to. The other qualification that you need to pick on, you have to pick someone who shares the passion and ambition for growth and ambition for doing better and doing the very best that you can. If you don't share this and you're pulling opposite directions, uh, that partnership can survive, but will not last during um, challenging times. You need to have someone who you can grow together, you can build things, you can dream together, you can do things, um, uh, try new things without. Yeah. And to work, you have an assignment, is not going to give an excuse that you know I cannot work today. You're not going to have a partner who had too much last night, too much drink last night, and comes in late to a meeting. A partner who cannot do a small presentation when he's requested because he just doesn't think he has the time. A partner who cannot do pro bono. A partner who has no commitment to work. He will do, I call them minimalist. He will do the most minimum and he wants to take advantage of you by the money he wants, but not to do much. So you have to have someone you know has commitment to work. One who has client capital. When I talk of client capital, it's people capital. One who can interact well with people. I had a partner who was the best you can think of, 
But once it's done with the client, the client says, I don't want this fellow to touch my files again. You need someone who has that capital, who can keep clients and, and clients keep coming. We have clients who have stayed with us for 35 years. They never went anywhere else. You need to have a client who, a, a partner who should add uh, some diversity in the practice, especially if you're getting a third, a fourth, a fifth one, uh, people who are coming with different focus, different experience and, and focus area so that you have diversity in your practice and especially in our, in our uh, jurisdictions. We do a lot of specialization, but um, depending on how the economy is behaving, you may have to actually look in other areas, even where the areas you don't think you should have focused. A good example, we are in our practice now um, including in our in a practice area for white collar crime, um, which was a no go area some years back. Uh, so you, you need to have diversity in the practice. You need to be very good friends, the person you pick to be your partner, not a drinking buddy or someone who you, you're going to joy drive with, no, but someone that you, you feel good and happy to be nearby, to discuss uh, uh, complex issues with to work closely with, to work late hours and late nights without um, concern, uh, even if um, it's a man and a woman, you know, you respect each other to the extent that that's the first person who will be informed when something was to happen to you. If you were to get an accident, you have to have a problem. You, have, you may have brothers, but the partner may be the person who will first be notified. And that's how uh, it, uh, important it is uh, when you choose a partner. You are choosing actually another lifetime uh, partner. Now, um, in a, when you have a partnership, uh, can, can you go to the next slide, please? This is not exactly my area, but a partnership um, will thrive when you have a structure. Um, and that structure will require um, the, a, a, a managing partner, will require a leader whether you have one or not. In our practice, uh, when I was leaving for the foreign office, the market just had assumed I was the managing partner and we never had a managing partner as per se. So eventually as I was leaving, it became necessary to actually announce and tell our clients that the managing partner now is going to be so-and-so because that's what the market dictates. You cannot uh, behave as if Every partner is actually um, equal. You are equal, yes, but you need to have one that clients can say, I am not happy, your so-and-so has done this, and that partner will be the managing partner. And then you go down um, to that uh, level. Uh, my colleague, uh, when he presented, uh, he said, uh, legal practice is a business. You cannot do a business when you're just the two partners you don't have associates, you don't have an accountant, you don't have support staff. You, you, know, you are your own driver, your, your own accountant, your own um, PA. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, and well, it's like man. Um, I'm, I'm afraid we have uh, some background sound. Actually, I think we've lost. Uh, Ambassador. Hello. 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 I've lost you guys. Okay. Can you hear me? Hello. We can hear yes. you. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you now. Yes, please proceed. I'm here. I was uh, I was winding up. Did you hear me wind up? Okay. I, I, did you hear me wind up? No, I think I'm done. I said that's all I have to say for today. I don't know where you lost me. At what point did you lose me? 
I, I think it was to just what point did you lose me? I think it was just before the winding up uh, because there was some echo in the background. So if you can just do the winding up part and then we're, uh, and then I think that would be fine. Okay. Um, I think someone from your uh, site stopped my video. So I cannot start it, but I can just wind up to say, um, I, I was, uh, pardon me? Please go ahead. Go ahead, Balou. I was saying that that's all I, I needed to say. I want to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you um, very, very much uh, for that brilliant uh, presentation, Balozi. Uh, short, uh, precise, and very, very clear. You've touched on a number of uh, really, really uh, critical issues uh, as we seek to find in partners, matters of trust. Your partner in business at the law firm is just like your partner in life. Have that partner that, um, you know, you can, um, uh, you, you can trust uh, with your life. Thank you very much. I'm sure, and I've seen in the Young Lawyers group, uh, people sharing about your presentation and others. So I'm sure in the plenary and Q&A, we'll hear more from them. Uh, thank you very, very much again. And um, next, uh, our next topic is uh, getting, getting clients um, as a, a beginner. And to present on that topic, I have uh, a great honor to introduce uh, Omar Said Shaban, a founding uh, partner here at Said Attorney, my lifetime partner. And uh, everything, Balozi, you've just said about partnership, that is me with this dude. Uh, Omar Said Shaban, who, by the way, will be leaving soon. Uh, and I'm assuming the managing partner, so all the things you're talking about. He'll be uh, leaving soon to assume his political role, but I don't know who planned this, but everything you said about partnership, that is me with this dude. Omar, come on here, young people, young lawyers would like to hear about you. And I'm not saying anything about your profile other than you are one of the best lawyers in Zanzibar and well, soon you will resume your role as member of the House of Representatives of Zanzibar. Karibu Omar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masood. Thank you, uh, President uh, uh, Udo. Uh, I was just uh, attentively following the, the presentation uh, of uh, Balozi, and I could just see you following closely and uh, how you tick the checklist. <laughs> Uh, thanks again, East Africa Law Society, uh, for the opportunity and uh, for inviting me to be together with this great panelists and uh, sharing uh, the experience uh, on the practice and particularly in this topic on getting clients as a beginner. Yes, as we all know that everyone, uh, every one of us uh, was in once uh, upon time was a beginner when we started our practice. And uh, this is one of the things that uh, uh, as a beginner and the young lawyers find it's difficult to penetrate to the market. Uh, so I would, I would be very much happy to share uh, with uh, young lawyers uh, in East Africa and uh, the panelists of, uh, of my own experience and also the knowledge that I, 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 I have uh, in getting this uh, sorted uh, for young lawyers. Uh, there is, I, would, I, would, I would start by saying that uh, there is no um, uniform formula on how to get the clients uh, as a beginner. It's, it all depends on the background. It all depends on the environment someone is practicing and the jurisdictions. So, uh, you know, as we all know, some jurisdictions uh, requires that uh, every person admitted must uh, start under the supervision of a senior counsel or attach himself in a firm. But in other jurisdiction, once you are admitted, you are like in a free zone. You can just do what uh, it takes for you to 
uh, hit and run. Uh, so it, there is no formula in Zanzibar. We all know that, um, uh, or some might be interested to know that uh, it's not a requirement that after you, you are admitted, you should be attached to a farm under the supervision of a senior council. I understand also in some jurisdiction in East Africa, uh, it's a requirement that once you, you, you are done with the practice, uh, you, you, I mean with the study and you are admitted, you have to be attached to a farm under the provision. I think uh, in some jurisdictions, two years or three before you can uh, uh, start uh, going independent and uh, or two in your own feet. So uh, that I was saying that there is no, there is no, there is no uh, uniform form. What I would, what is the most important is, uh, uh, it is to make sure that uh, you, you network. Uh, previous uh, speaker have said it all about what's the global market dictate, what's the legal, the growth of the legal, legal market and uh, uh, practice as a business. Uh, so the most important, I think, I believe in uh, getting a client as a beginner, uh, a young lawyer needs to, to network. And uh, by networking, I would say that uh, you make sure uh, you attend whenever possible uh, in those uh, professional forums, uh, if they're available in your jurisdiction, even the regional ones, and, uh, and also the business forums and also other related uh, uh, practice area forums. Say, for example, if your interest is on the criminal law, make sure that whenever there is any 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 forum, uh, any meetings or stakeholders meetings discussing on the criminal justices and all that, attend because it's that's where you will meet uh, the people to work with and ultimately the clients. Uh, and if you are in a, in a, and also you will know how the market. Uh, goes uh, in the area of, of your practice because you'll meet a lot of people. But also uh, the, the business forums, uh, uh, one of our panelists have said uh, that uh, legal practice is now actually a business and uh, not just uh, as, a, as academic uh, uh, engagement. Uh, so whenever you there is a, a business forums, uh, business are so much attached with the legal practice so make sure that uh, those which offer uh, that you can afford it to attend, if it's uh, for invitation, if it's for fee, uh, just make sure that you, you will attend. But also, uh, not only that, uh, we, Masood, uh, moderator, you, you, you will also testify about this. It's not about attending, but it's also connecting. You know, uh, we have, uh, uh, I've seen quite a lot, in, especially in the regional forums like East Africa, many young lawyers who attend do that, that means somebody comes alone and live alone without even exchanging uh, cards and making friends. Uh, nowadays, in my, my, my experience shows that in practice, business also comes from other fellows. You know, not only you get uh, your own fresh client, because uh, uh, there are few uh, out there, but you can also get a referral. And uh, now we are talking of the cross-border. You can get clients from, uh, from the fellows from other jurisdictions. We, this has proved uh, right to us in many aspects. Uh, in our farm, we get businesses and clients from the people we meet in these forums because we were connecting and uh, we, we were... We were, we were we, we, we attend and connect and make sure that uh, we create that network with, with fellows who ultimately end up in uh, bringing business to, to our jurisdictions. Uh, another thing is uh, pro bono. Uh, I would say pro bono, pro bono doesn't uh, uh, do any harm to a young lawyer, but it's actually it's open opportunities uh, to young lawyers to get uh, clients. Because as we all know, pro bono uh, services has, uh, has a limit uh, or has a scope, uh, you will, you, you might find yourself uh, serving a, 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 a person in need in a pro bono basis. And ultimately that person can either be good ambassador to you, to other people who are paid clients, or that person can come next time uh, uh, for paid up uh, 
arrangement of the services that people uh, uh, need. Uh, another thing uh, which is very important is uh, Omar, creating... We have, uh, two minutes to wrap up. I'll Thanks. be tough so, on you because you are my friend. <laughs> I'm just wrapping up now with the moderator. Uh, uh, setting uh, uh, branding, personal branding. Uh, this has been spoken by other, other panelists. Uh, personal branding is very, very, very important. And then you can start uh, by just creating yourself a business card that you can help people uh, and uh, people can identify who you are, what you're doing. Uh, it's important uh, also in all the social media accounts, which is very uh, common nowadays, uh, put, describe yourself with your professional professions and uh, what you are doing. This is the way people will link up. This prove uh, positive to me. I uh, have uh, clients, I have a deal with people who are just connecting to me because they have seen uh, my social media account to identify myself as an advocate or practicing attorney in Zanzibar and the people connect. So uh, because of the interest of time, this is a very uh, interesting and big topic, but I will end up there and then we'll be uh, available to respond to questions. And I know this topic is connecting with other topics that to come and those which have been already presented. Thank you, Mr. Moderator and uh, the panelists. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Omar, my dear friend and partner here at Saida Attorney and Associates. Um, yeah, and for the interest of time, I won't have much time to comment on your uh, topic, but uh, obviously key takeaway, networking, and I think those are business forums and professional forums that you've mentioned. We have gone there, I've seen you uh, taking our colleagues there, and they they pay off. So thank you very much. And I'm sure uh, participants will uh, engage you further uh, in the Q&A and uh, uh, plenary session. Now, uh, next, um, a very interesting topic, uh, structuring the practice towards a, a commercial uh, enterprise. Uh, this will be uh, presented um, by a non other than uh, Clever Nigarura. Uh, now, Clever Nigarura is a managing partner at Rubea and Co Advocates, uh, a leading uh, law firm, and he practices in uh, uh, Burundi. He's got many accolades and recognized by um, uh, many um, uh, directories, international uh, lawyers directories. But you do have the profile. Uh, let us see the man himself. You're most welcome. Um, uh, Advocate uh, Claver Nigarura, the floor is yours. Karibu. You have uh, 10 minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Claver Nigarura. Uh, I am the managing partner at uh, Rubea and Co Advocate. I'm very happy to be here to make this presentation. Um, I thank the president and the, the secretary general and the secretariat team for this opportunity. It's a big privilege to be on this panel of uh, prominent lawyers, senior lawyers. Um, I'm not a specialist of uh, managing firm or strategist in this uh, field, but I, I will share my experience, my six years experience as a managing partner of a law firm in Burundi. Uh, so um, my colleague David uh, will um, assist in displaying slides. The next slide, please. Uh, my presentation, I will focus on the uh, introduction first. I will focus on our strategy. Uh, strategy. Uh, I will focus also on our operation. And uh, I will make a very small uh, conclusion. So uh, to introduce, as I already said, a lawyer is a service provider. 
uh, legal services are a sort locally, but can be also exported. Uh, there are four modes for cross-border trade. This can also apply for legal services, whether it's uh, by consumption abroad, whether it is by physical presence, when the laws and the regulation are law, uh, permit, uh, it may be by temporary movement of natural person. A person from Nairobi can come in Bujumbura, uh, uh, um, make a deal, and go back home, uh, money in the pocket. And the law firm is, in fact, an enterprise. Next slide. Oh, uh, to put into the context, we are uh, ASL lawyers, and uh, we know that this is a good thing to know, that it's a very big market for us. It's a market of uh, uh, 177 million people uh, with this uh, uh, GDP you see on the screen. But there is competition uh, from ASL lawyers between us, African firms outside of the AC, and international firms from Rwanda, from France, from Hong Kong, from China. And also, when we talk about ESC, uh, we think about uh, coexistence of uh, two legal systems, uh, the civil one and the common law one. But the good news is that there is a new practice uh, which comes from this uh, integration, uh, a practice that can be developed, a practice uh, related to the ESC law. Next. First of all, when uh, uh, one wants to move from good to great, uh, uh, being in a, a company, being a person, it's necessary, it's mandatory to have a vision. So there is a vision for law firm uh, in order uh, to, to move from good to best. Uh, that vision um, has to answer to the typical questions what type of law firm we would like to be? Uh, what kind of services we would like to deliver? What will be our geographic coverage? To whom we would like to sell our services? How do we want to, live, to deliver this service? And what kind of service? Because there are so many services that a law firm can deliver. For an example, this is uh, uh, our stated vision as a law firm. Uh, we, we would like to be a leading firm uh, in Burundi, delivering value added service to local and international clients. Uh, I can note that it is important that that vision is known and is understood by all the people in the, in, the, in, the, in the office. It can be displayed uh, in the reception room or on other, other platforms because it is not good when one staff can't state the vision of, 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 of the firm. Uh, I'm sure uh, that this can uh, exist somewhere. Uh, and it is not good if a firm doesn't have one, a stated vision, one. Because this vision allows us uh, to, to come in the morning uh, knowing the, the, the direction. That is, uh, the, I think it's, a, it's, a, it is, it's like a compass so that we can't lose the north. Uh, second thing I want to talk about is about strategic planning. If uh, you are uh, a law firm, it is important uh, to take time uh, to make strategy. 
to go, for example, for a strategy retreat for one week, one day, one week, to think about the future, to think uh, about where we want to go, uh, to make a strategy on people. What, what are the, the people, what are the lawyers would like to have in one year, in two years, in five years? What uh, are the qualifications of other professionals uh, like the, the support staff we would like to have? Uh, to make a strategy on the clients, what kind of the clients the law firm wants to target? Local, international, natural person, companies, etc. And uh, uh, write down the targets and how do will we reach those target clients? Uh, I want to talk about business development and the marketing. And also have a strategy in terms of service. What kind of service you would like to deliver? Uh, do you focus on litigation? Do you focus on a transaction? What can uh, the, the other uh, matter to look at as uh, when a strategizing is the practice or sector strategy? What uh, will we focus on labor law or will we focus on a specific sector like uh, energy or banking? Um, also have a strategy uh, on price. This is very important because you have to take uh, care of, uh, of the, the money of uh, our clients. Uh, the clients would not necessarily take the cheapest lawyer, that is true, but uh, for one um, uh, shilling paid, he would like to, um, to see value and uh, to see that uh, it's, it's worth to pay that one dollar, even if it's one dollar or one shilling. Next. Uh, Previous uh, presenters have uh, talked about uh, making the difference. I think competition is there. Uh, we have to make difference. Uh, we have to be the best choice, to be the first to be recommended, uh, being able to say why uh, people are uh, recommending us. Next. Uh, sometimes there is a question when we we got and we get a new client, we have to to answer to this question: Why the telephone ring in our office, not into the in the into the the neighbor's office? Um, research have shown that there are some some important factors to look at: the skills availability and uh, accessibility. The skills, this may relate to law, uh, knowing the, the uh, that is the core knowledge of a, every law, law, but also other skills like technology, like how you, you manage the, um, the knowledge you have, the database, the, 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 the the data you can access and how you manage them. Uh, and lawyers, as lawyers, we have to be available. Uh, to be available, it's not that we have uh, uh, to be drinking every day with our clients, but we have to, to have time <laughs> to meet our clients, uh, to deliver on the time. And when I talk about accessibility, it's about uh, the um, also, the, the issue of a price is much between the cost and the service delivered. Uh, is it possible to, to go to the next slide, please? As you wrap up, please. The next. Yes, the next. The next. You can go to the next. Can go to the next. 
So uh, the other important uh, matter is about towards professionalizing operation in the, in the law firm. Uh, when the law firm grows, there is a need for professionalizing the, the support system in order to allocate resources effectively and efficiently. The human resources management, the business development and marketing, the finance management, the IT and the structure, the knowledge management. The next slide. Uh, I am aware that sometimes it is difficult to, to hire all of those the professionals, a human resources manager, a knowledge uh, manager, and uh, a, an accountant. But it is possible to develop those skills as a lawyer in those uh, areas. And it is also important to leverage on the technology uh, to smooth our operation, reduce costs for the interest of our clients. Uh, technology is very important and it can also allow us to reach new clients. Next slide. Oh, for me, uh, as a conclusion, uh, for moving from good to the best, there is a need for uh, aligning some factors the organization of the law firm. We talk about the structure, governance, the leadership, the culture of the law firm, uh, including the values, the strategic objectives, and the, the operation systems. Uh, those, are, according to me, are the pillar, uh, the pillars to look at uh, if we want to move from one step to another. Thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup à Santé Sana. Merci beaucoup à Claver, c'était magnifique. Uh, and uh, yeah, with that, uh, again, great presentation. Uh, I wish I could have more time to comment, but I can't. Uh, but uh, some of the key takeaways you're telling us to ask ourselves, what is the strategy for my practice, for my law firm? What is my vision? Who is my client or who do I want uh, to be my client? And you reminded us that we have a market of 177 uh, million. So there could be job for every good lawyer uh, out there, a good one who's going to become great. Now, next one. Um, this is uh, on budgeting and other financial matters. This is very uh, critical. And to present on this topic is none other than uh, Harriet uh, Chigai, uh, known. Uh, this is a household, na household name for young lawyers in East Africa. Uh, she was uh, holding a position that I'm holding now, representative young lawyer's representative uh, at the EAC, the ELS level. She's currently the managing partner of Chigai and uh, company advocates. And she's involved in uh, mentoring, but you do have the profile in your own time. And I'm sure a lot of you have gone through it. Uh, my good friend, Harriet Karibu, East Africa is waiting to hear from you. Inspire us, please. Thank you very much, Mosud. Hi, how have you been? Great. Um, I hope you can hear me. I've been having a bit of challenge with the internet uh, fluctuation. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear we can. you. All right, thank you for that. Um, ELS President Ougo, your EBOSG, Mosud. ELS uh, President Emeritus Mugisha, Ambassador Monaidi, ELS Secretariat led by the CEO and uh, Dan, who have been very instrumental in putting this particular webinar in place. Thank you very much. It is indeed an honor for me to be able to participate um, in this particular webinar. And I'm so delighted that ELS has kept the banner burning and uh, has organized this very important uh, webinar. Um, 
allow me to delve into the uh, discussion of this afternoon because Mosud, you've given me 10 minutes and you know lawyers cannot take the floor with 10 minutes. 10 minutes be is too the, short a time. Because <laughs> we tend to be too wordy. So mm -hmm. thank you, East Africa. Thank you for logging in. Um, the interest that you have exuded is uh, very encouraging. And um, I wish for us to have a very open discussion. And even after this presentation, it would be my joy that we engage further. The topic I was given is budgeting and other financial matters for law firms. The reason as to why I will not put the um, presentation here, it's because at times we tend to read instead of focusing and listening to the presenters. So I will share my presentation that, and it will be circulated uh, to everyone later. So on matters budgeting, I'm sure many lawyers ask, why do we need to budget? Noting very well, we run our kiosks or our law firms within a very small uh, segment. It's almost like we run our law firms almost like our homes. So you find in most cases, we don't put budgets in place. But the question we want to answer today is um, why do we need to budget as law firms? Number one, it is very important to budget because it allows us to plan. Take note, law firms are, are business entities. Imagine you're running a bank. How do you manage a bank or any other financial sector without financial projections? Noting very well, you need your business to grow. So it is important for planning. It is important for us to also know how much or what kind of technology we need to invest in. And you all know that the global uh, world right now within the business sector, we are all moving to technology and COVID has shown us that without technology, we are not going to be able to run businesses within the global market. So with that in mind, we also need to budget for technology. We need to invest in people. You can only know how much investment you need in people if you're able to budget and map out your business entities. Marketing and the improvements within the business. Most of us take our clients for lunches. Most of us had, have our meetings outside the office. But guess what? You should never say, this is from my pocket. It needs to be well-funded by the organization. And guess what? If you don't budget and if you do not have the money, then you don't need to spend. So you have to budget. And whenever you budget, if you exceed that budget, you have to put a supplementary budget in place paired with the amount of money that you have at hand. And also projections in terms of business growth. When we look at um, analysis and gaps within the law firm, you can only tell that if you budget for your particular business. And this is very important because you can only be able to map out the gaps within your business if you do a proper budget and then you plan in terms of what is the need current, the need within the middle segment of um, the year, and then towards the end of the year, how much money do you think you need and how much money do you need um, within that uh, the, the annual uh, within the year, the financial year for your firm. So legal case management, some of us don't review uh, our, our files. Now, if you don't budget, you'll not be able to tell how much money you need for purposes of lodging even cases in court or how much money you need to manage a particular file at bare minimum. I always tell uh, my associates that um, it's very important that each file you get should be able to meet a particular fraction of your expenses, of your monthly expenses within a law firm. How do you calculate that if you don't budget, if you don't map out your costs? Not most of us take one big file and we are happy because it can pay bills for the whole year. But guess what? Each and every file that you have should be able to have a component in terms of how you're going to budget for the year. And uh, why am I saying this and why is it uh, very important? Because it's important for your small law firm, middle law firm, or big law firm to stay in business. COVID has taught us that we also need to budget for calamities. Most firms which had no budget for calamities did not survive. 
most farms have closed. Most uh, farms went home. And remember, during COVID period, it was also very difficult to borrow money from any bank. So there were no bank overdrafts. Why? Each and every business entity had their budget. And those who had already expensed their risk budget, they were not willing to risk anymore. And then you'll find most financial institutions were actually giving you a whole list, uh, a whole checklist and making it so difficult for you to borrow. Yet at the end of the day, they had made a conscious decision that they are not going to make use of any more budget or they're not going to make use of any of the monies that they had put in their safe custody for certain um, risks. And uh, COVID was one of them. So it is very, very important for us uh, to budget. Now, how do we uh, budget? One thing I wish to tell is that law firms need to have a very strategic budget. It's important that the process of budgeting, we involve everyone within that business. Why am I saying this? At times, partners may not be very much aware of the needs of your secretary in terms of administration. Now, it is important to include everybody within the budgeting making process because it will also advise you as the partner the gaps that you're having within the business. Now, once each and every department or each and every individual who is running or managing a particular segment within the law firm, including HR, finance, admin, uh, partners, all these specific individuals or departments must put in place their budget. The budget for the department, if there's a department, or the budget for your individual, uh, for, for, for each and every individual. Once you have the budgets for all these particular uh, persons, you then come together and consolidate that budget. Why do you need to do that? It's always very important to involve everybody within that organization. Once you consolidate the budget, you need to consolidate the same, aligning it with your business plan and strategic plan. Why am I saying that? It is important for you to take note of what is very important and what can wait. And then when you're budgeting also, don't budget exact amount of money. Populate your budget so that you also give each and every individual within the firm performance matrices. Most people imagine that performance matrices is about going to court. How many times you've gone to court? No, that is not enough or how many clients you have seen during a particular day or period. The question I want to ask is, when you're billing your clients, what are you looking at? You have to align all that with your business plan, with your projections for growth within the next four years or five years, depending on the strategic plan that you have. I'm also saying it's important that you have these two documents, the strategic plan of the institution and a business plan, no matter how small your firm is. These two documents are very important. Um, one thing I must say, Mosud, I said 10 minutes is really short for us to discuss this particular issue because most law firms operate almost like briefcase offices. It is what I earn today, what I will spend tomorrow, and then the next day will take care of itself. Now, once we consolidate the budgets, you need to have the same well-segmented to fit within the year, especially on expenses. Now, most people um, imagine that the moment I budget, let's say, three million for petty cash or three million for branding, everybody now thinks we must expense completely that three million. And the answer is no. Once you budget, number one, you'll be able to tell where your money goes every year. It will help you plan the next financial year, either by increasing the budget or doing a checklist of where all your expenses go and see where you can reduce expenses that ideally you don't need to have within the particular business. So it is very, very, very important that we plan for growth and uh, we reduce costs. I know most lawyers say you must spend to earn more. 
But guess what? At times you need to cut expenses and COVID has shown us that. Um, so within that budgeting, you must also budget very well for petty cash. These are monies that in most cases we do not want to account for. Guess what? Each and every coin that is removed from the company or the firm must be accounted for. I have found this very important because within the legal entity, most lawyers don't want to account for the monies they have spent. And when questions are asked, it becomes war. And that is why partnerships don't last long. So this is a discussion that we've really been having for a long time. But I think it's time that we start operating our businesses or our law firms as business entities. Now, within the other financial issues that affect our law firms, allow me to touch on internal audits. I'm sure if I was to ask how many of us audit our law firm's finances, I will get almost 15%. We do not audit how we spend our money or how the monies that the law firms generate, including the files, how those monies are used and whether law firms are really making losses or profits. For as long as you hit your jackpot of let's say 10 million, you're very happy to buy the next Mercedes, move to a bigger office, do proper branding and wear your next big nice suit. But guess what? You need to audit your finances. Um, all financial expenses, no matter what, including petty cash must be audited. Audit the files that you're handling. Audit your time allocation to those files. Audit your time within those law firms. Audit how you spend time with also your clients. Check all these things and then you'll realize where a lot of time is wasted and where a lot of money is wasted. Now, when it comes to questions of audits, I know when audit questions are raised within a law firm, everybody thinks that money has been lost. No, that is usually not the issue. In fact, when all these questions are raised within an audit um, segment, it only points to the weaknesses, the gaps and the risk margins within which we operate in. And it's all good. It's also important to know the weaknesses of your institution. And where these questions are asked, it's very important that we get to answer those same questions. And that need not break partnerships. In fact, it should strengthen partnerships because once you map out your risks, once you note where the gaps are, you put in place proper policies that will enable you run your law firms as business entities. So there should be no cause of alarm, even if your partner could not explain, let's say half a million. It only means next time, he should do his budgeting and he should be able to uh, account for all the monies that were spent or even any other employee within the institution. And you can only address that by putting in place measures and policies to guide how uh, work is done within the law firms. Now, um, the reason as to why I will emphasize on auditing is because most lawyers, when you talk about audit, it's an investigation. While at the same time, Institutions need to map out their internal risks and external risks and find out the mitigating factors within those risks margins. So once an auditor does the audit and they give you the management letter, which points out to various risks that you're facing as a law firm, it goes without saying that they are only improving your business entity. And as you progress, you'll be able to improve those particular areas that have been marked as, a, as questionable or for improvement. Now, the other area that law firms have failed, uh, most law firms have failed to look inward and address is matters to do with compliance and risks. You need to do a proper analysis for your law firms. Right now we do legal audits for all the other corporates, but we are forgetting about ourselves. So what are the main risks that law firms have? And I'll point a few. For partners who are seated here, and you'll agree with me on this one, your number one risk is associates. True or false? You might not answer. But you have associates within a year. You've trained them. You have done proper, uh, you've allocated them work. And the moment they leave, there is no proper handover. There is no proper um, uh, documentation of uh, whatever it is that they were working on. And you find 
that this is number one risks within law firms. HR matters are very important when it comes to resources. Finance related risks, COVID is a good example. If you do not have proper risk management analysis, then you will fail. And this is why most law firms which had an extra saving, when you earn in a law firm, you must save. You must be able to run your law firm for two years, status quo, paying the same rent if you're paying rent. And if you're not paying rent, thank God you bought premises, but your same office should be able to run for at least two years without you feeling the pinch. So are we saving enough for our law firms? With also that, within any amount of money that we get, are we able to put in place some money for investment? So not whatever earnings you get, you must have one, a savings platform for your law firm, and two, an investment platform. Remember, these businesses are never on this uh, high rise all the time. At times we are in the low, at times we are making money. So you need to be able to save, you need to be able to put money in place, money that can make money for you, and money that can help you run your business for the next two years within the same uh, platform. Now, do we also do sort analysis for our law firms? Sort analysis is basically planning. Are we doing proper analysis to see where the gaps I think we've lost Harriet. Mm -hmm. Harriet? I think, we've, I think we've lost Harriet. What we shall do because of the time, we will proceed. Yes. And in case she gets back, she'll be able to do some closing remarks. So let me just quickly go into the question and answer session. I'll just ask the three people would want to see you, young lawyers. And I realize that 37 questions have been answered in our Q&A box, which is OK. I request the panelists to put back the videos on. So I'll just request the three people who have consistently put their hands up. I see Edward Obo. Mr. Edward Obo, can you go ahead with your question? Oh, Harriet, we lost you before you concluded. I'll give you time to do concluding remarks. Sorry. Mm. Edward Obo, could you please ask your question, sir? Okay. Since we can't find him, I'll ask Mr. Bagavo Faustin. Could you please ask your question? Hello. Hello. We can hear you, Mr. Faustin. Please be precise. Yes, uh, I, I had a wish that you should share uh, with us the presentations as they are very interesting to any young lawyer who has been following up the present. That, that was my wish. Okay, thank you, Faustin. We shall share all the yes. presentations. Yes, with uh, regard to the question. Share. Yes. Yes, yes. I, I just wanted to ask on the issue of uh, how to choose a partner. Mm. Uh, my question is, uh, normally choosing a partner is very difficult as the presenter did say, but I wanted to know when we say that, the, when we talk about experience and capacity, uh, I, I, want, I want her to come back on the issue of capacity. All people are not really, don't have the same capacity, even in a class, even in a, in, in, in a household as she, con she compared the, the household and the partnership. Uh, but I want to know, wh what does she mean by capacity? All right. We, we brilliance. Thank you very much. Yes, we shall answer your question. Please, when you're asking a question, please just be precise. Because as you know, time is always not our best ally. Let me ask Miss Victoria Nasuna. Please ask your question.
Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Victoria. We can hear you loud and clear. Yes. Um. How are you? How is everyone? Um, we are mine, well. was, mine was about uh, sustainability of a uh, of a law firm in this uh, in this um, pandemic time. How how best can you advise the young lawyers with law firms on how they can sustain it for maybe about a period of two years because we are still in the pandemic period. That's what I wanted to to highlight on. Thank you, Victoria, for your question. Mr. Richard Mucha will take that one. Um, Ms. Salehe Nasoro, please ask your question. Okay, if we can't get him. Last one, Gulume, please ask your question. Hello? Hello? Hello, can please you hear me? Ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, my question goes to uh, the presenter presenting on the issue of uh, cross-ordering legal practice. So now, here in Tanzania, for instance, uh, the, the government want to change to Swahili. And also, I'm aware that uh, other countries are using different languages. So how can uh, be able to get clients on the cross-border legal practice why the language can act as barrier thank you that's the question language as a barrier okay mr clever i think you the one who discussed cross-border practice you'll take that question um sorry young lawyers i'm going to just have to take two more questions please put your questions and uh, questions in the q and a section they'll be responded to let me just take philip zulu mr philip zulu please go ahead Oh, we had already permitted last one. Last one, if you're yes, ready. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question goes to the training of associates and, and it being a risk on the farm in case these associates leave. In terms of budgeting, how do you work around training associates and getting the best out of them uh, in the training you have given them to give the value to the farm? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Harriet Chigai will take that question. Training. Okay. And, sorry, uh, you, um, sorry, 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 President. What was yes, the question the, again? The question is on training of associates. How do you train them to ensure that they are giving value to the farm? I okay. think it's a question on balance, yeah. Um, let me ask lastly, oh. Mr. Victor Savimana. All right, can you permit Philip Zulu if he's permitted, please? No, I think about Hello? Hello? Can you hear me, sir? We can hear you, please ask your question. Okay, my, my question is, um, uh, can you advise uh, mushrooming law firms to begin uh, acquiring their equipment using uh, Finance listen or equipment listen contract. Okay. Mr. David Pango, would you take that one, please? I'm not sure I have understood you, but do, do you want some the, 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 the answer is a, is a, is a mix. Um, there is value in buying and owning some equipment, uh, but certainly no value in getting very expensive equipment. That's these. For example, you're not going to get a big photocopier, um, pay 20 million shillings for it, Uganda shillings, uh, for it when you're, a, you're a, an up and coming law firm. You could even outsource and still do your, your thing outside, a little bit of printing in house if you need to. Later, when you become bigger, you can begin to get value from owning some of these assets. I think it's a, it's a, it's a financial management. Um, Harriet might have a, a, a more ready answer, but my answer would be don't go in sinking money into big things where the life of the, the return life is long. Maximize your position by initially leasing 
outsourcing, and then as you grow, start acquiring. Thank you, David. I'll also ask you to just give your concluding remarks as you, so we will, I'll ask every panelist to answer the question and also give a concluding remark because of the time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Secretary General, for a great invitation to this great uh, talk. I've learned a lot. Um, I also learned that there was a very old lawyer who sent a question um, who's been attending, so I'm not the only old lawyer who's attended this. Um, I think one of the things that I'd like to leave everybody with is learning never ends. I didn't maybe really put that forward, but if you go in with a mindset of knowing everything, then there's a lot that you're not going to be able to master. So keep learning, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to learn from you, teach all the things. Thank you, thank you, David. I will go to Ambassador Sinari. I think there was no specific question, but if you want to comment on any of the questions asked, please comment um, yeah. and also give your concluding remarks, Ambassador. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, there was a question relating to um, how do you know about capacity? Yes. I did not exactly talk about capacity. I talked about ability, I talked about integrity, trustworthy, I talked about being experienced, smart, and I didn't emphasize experience because when you are a young lawyer and you are, are looking for a, a, a colleague, um, there isn't a lot of experience, but there is a lot of uh, uh, smartness. There's a lot of commitment to work. There's a lot of ability to work, and there's a lot of um, um, enthusiasm. Um, what can you say? The passion. Someone who has the same passion as you. So capacity uh, is something um, not easily measurable, uh, except from um, um, the kind of area of focus that your, the person you're going to pick on uh, would have. So um, exactly that's what I meant when I talked about picking on someone who has the ability to be able to deliver on the kind of work they're going to do. Now, having said that, I would like to um, comment on two items. Um, uh, that was uh, the, about cross-border and what will happen if we do Kiswahili. Whether, whether you do Kiswahili or English, uh, uh, it doesn't really um, stop anyone coming to you. That when you have a client who wouldn't understand Kiswahili, surely you'll be addressing that uh, client in English. It, that has not been um, uh, prohibited. The, 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 the emphasis has been uh, about doing Kiswahili in courts uh, to get um, the multitude of the population who don't understand uh, to be able to follow uh, the proceedings. And it didn't mean that English has been prohibited from the courtrooms. Um, I, I wanted to say that because it's, um, it's the, 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 the hot topic at the moment. On equipment leasing, we are an established law, uh, um, law firm. We lease all our printing equipment. We lease most of the things that we do. We outsource the staff who come do the cleaning. So I think, uh, as you start, that will be the easiest way uh, to uh, save on you. Plus, owing a lot of, of properties as a law firm is not the best. We, we, in our experience, we had a house um, where we had our offices. Some partners would want to sell, some partners would want to keep. So the best is uh, to lease rather than to actually buy. Um, then during pandemic, at the moment, for example, our office is partially closed uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, uh, we are all working offsite. What we do is we do meetings um, where we, the, the teams will meet by Zoom or by Teams and we, we do business, we conduct and we have the, 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 the job controllers trying to uh, follow the, their teams, what they're doing. Um, last year, it was not very great. We lost revenue. Um, substantially, a uh, substantial revenue from the budget uh, that we ex anticipated. But I think this year we are doing better. We, 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 are, we have experienced how we can handle that. Now, having gone through all those questions, I, I wanted to add something small. 
on what my brother Omar uh, talked about. I wanted to talk about the social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those free branding. If you're a young lawyer, you have all these things we didn't have in our time. Even having something on the print media was not even allowed. You were not supposed to advertise. But now you can go out there and people know that now you've started your practice. So it's very important when you are, you are setting up to, to go out there to be noticed. Then people will notice you in their thousands. Uh, um, I want to thank the staff community, the president, the secretariat, and all those who put this. Thank you so much. I have learned also you uh, greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Sinari, and for his uh, coming whenever we ask you to. I will ask President Emeritus Richard Mogisha. And as we do this, as we do the concluding remarks, I'll ask the young lawyers to share any topics that they would want discussed so that we are responsive to your needs. Please share them as we conclude. You can share them in the Q&A section or in the chat group. President Emeritus, you're welcome yeah, to uh, concluding remarks. Thank you, thank you, President Oundo. I, I think uh, there was a question that you asked me to respond to, which was about uh, sustainability. Yes. And I think I'll use the same question uh, as part of my concluding remarks as well. Um, uh, if you're going to sustain the business, even in challenging times, uh, you're going to have to be agile, like um, David earlier mentioned. You have to be agile, uh, look out for, for new uh, possibilities, and invest in yourself. For example, uh, I don't think that... Um, any of the young lawyers right now are going to make money from incorporating companies like we used to do uh, uh, when we started off. And we made a lot of money from that, but you know, that is not there anymore. There's no money in conveyancing, that is gone. Technology has taken over. We just have to be candid enough and make sure that uh, people are preparing themselves for the new, for the new, uh, opportunities. And, uh, and here I would like to cite a few. Um, make sure you are preparing yourself for environmental law, which I see as an emerging area, given how much damage humanity has caused on, on the planet. Uh, prepare yourself for uh, ICT regulation. It's going to be a, uh, an emerging area. Prepare yourself for trade. It's it's a it's 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 a new area. So, just look out for those new um, uh, uh, areas of the law and make sure that you are taking the right the, the, the necessary time to invest in yourself. Um, keep in touch with your clients, even though it may not be possible. Use whatever tool is available for you to keep in touch with your clients, and then realign uh, your budgets to make sure that you are introducing cost cut cutting measures that allow you for operational efficiencies uh, and, and make sure that you've got enough to, to sustain you uh, during this difficult period. Take pay cuts if you must, um, uh, but by all means, don't give up. This is, this is simply the wrong time to, to, to be hanging your boots uh, and, and, and just know that um, a satisfying legal career is one of the most fulfilling things that you will ever do for yourself. And so remain steadfast and eventually you're going to come out very happy with how you've spent your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Emeritus. I will then request President Omar to say give his closing remarks and make a few comments on the questions that were asked. Thank you, President. Uh, I think there was no specific questions on my uh, presentations, but uh, yeah, uh, my closing remarks to young lawyers would be, um, there are 
with the current uh, trend of practice, there are a lot to learn and uh, young lawyers can take full advantage of the of the developments in the legal practices and the experiences from the senior lawyers. And uh, as I always tell my associates, the legal practice is not like trading, like um, trading of goods, buy and sell. It's it's about showing, show, showing skills, uh, perfections. And uh, once you keep on practice, excelling, uh, people realize what you can do, what you can deliver. That's where you can create your own uh, your own uh, empire or your own uh, 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 cycle of, uh, of uh, clients and, uh, and, and the customers. So keep on uh, keep on learning, keep on uh, uh, sharing. Uh, I mean, learning from the past and uh, uh, you maximizing the, the opportunities that are available. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Omar. I will ask Miss um, Harriet Chigai to. Um, and so I think there are specific questions which were asked to you, and then you can also share your concluding remarks. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, President. Um, there's only one area that I had not talk, ta uh, talked about by the time my internet went down, apologies, members. Uh, it's the issue of taxes. Um, give to Caesar what belongs to, to Caesar. If you collect taxes because you're collecting on behalf of your government, don't invite unnecessary problems just pay the taxes i think that was the end of my presentation on matters to do with the questions that were asked i think i will tackle the two one is on training of associates uh, to ensure value for the firms first let me just tell uh, members that we all learn every other day i'm sure the senior most seated here today will tell us that every new day they learn and guess what? It's all about you as an individual and what you want to do within the business sector. You have to grow your space and grow your niche by always be willing to learn and go an extra mile for your bosses. I'm sure Mosud will tell you the reason as to why he's aspiring to take his current boss's seat. It's because he's 100% sure that his interests and that of his firm and that of his boss have been well taken care of under his ethical values and standards and how he respects his job. So that is one area that I've seen lacks within the spaces of employment that uh, most of us are not willing to learn. And at times you're not willing to take an extra mile or drive. Some of us walk into the offices very late and walk out early, you don't care. When your boss is busy drafting a certificate of urgency, you really are not concerned. If anything, the best learners are the ones who ask their bosses every other day, you have given me this, I am done. Is there anything else I can do? Can I be the one to champion this particular program or training or, you know, take something and own your space. Learning is about you and how far you want to go in terms of your growth within the business sphere. Um, on the issue of, um, office spaces and expenses. I mean, it's important to start very simple and there's nothing wrong in paying rent and outsourcing. I'll tell you for a fact, if you are to buy office space, you need to ask yourself one thing. Have you made that money over time? One, if you are to be in a business segment, how long will it take you to recoup the amount of investment that you're going to put in buying office space, for instance. Um, so for me, there's nothing wrong in terms of leasing space. It could be cheaper and way cheaper. There's nothing wrong in you outsourcing um, other officers, especially administrative ones like cleaning, um, um, others like even your reception, you can actually co-share. For young lawyers, I'll advise you, you can take a whole wing, partition it as a group on specific offices, and you can co-share certain um, amenities like a common secretary, a common port where your documentation can be received, you know. So cut on your human resources, it's very important. COVID has also shown us you really do not need a huge team to do certain work. Have a lean team, and the team must be able to do their job and do it well. Um, 
in terms of wrapping up for me first thank you president mugisha and uh, the team president um, uh, the current president the sitting president ohugo of ELS personally i've also learned from the other presenters uh, despite the fact that we were here to mentor, there's a lot I've also taken home. I don't take it for granted because it came free. And you know, I always tell people the things that you do for free are the ones which give you more satisfaction. So for me, thank you very much. This has been an enlightening webinar. I have learned a lot. And to the young lawyers within the East Africa, don't give up. We are all in the same boat. While you're thinking your business is sinking, all of us are in that boat. We are all now thinking, how can we recoup the one year that we've lost during COVID? We are all in the same boat. It only depends with how big your budget was last year, how big your expenses were, and your projections for the year. But it doesn't really matter. I think we are all on the same boat and reach out for help. For instance, if you are good friends with the, uh, President Mugisha and you are forced to close your law firm, ask him for space to give you a desk within his law firm. As you help him, you help yourself. So there are many ways we can work around um, the current situation that we are in right now. Be willing to work, be willing to learn, and above all, keep your networks. Thank you, thank you very much, President Ogo. Thank you so much, Harriet. Thank you so much. Um, let me move to uh, um, Mr. Clever Nicarora. Please give share your, your closing remarks and the answers to some of the questions that you are asked. Uh, thank you very much, President. There was a question about the language. I uh, consider language, uh, of course, as a challenge. It's a, it is a, in terms of skills and uh, knowledge. Uh, no one can um, uh, pretend to know everything. Uh, so um, if we can solve uh, others' problems, we can also solve this one. Uh, there, there is two ways. One, uh, working with someone uh, mastering that language. Uh, two, uh, learning that language. That's what I can uh, answer. What I can say about the question. As a closing remarks uh, to young lawyers, I can um, say only three words working together, collaborating uh, within the, the country or within the region. Mm, uh, last, embracing technology. I think uh, if um, young lawyers can um, put efforts on this, we can see um, in the near future, a very big law firms like uh, we are seeing on other market. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you for uh, to the panelists, and then thank you for the, the secretariat team. Thank you for to uh, thank you to the to the uh, audience. Have a nice um, even uh, uh, a nice a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Clever. Thank you for your thoughts um, and the responses to the questions. I'm going to make three important announcements. The first one is on mentorship. I'm going to ask my panelists. I did not speak to them before, but I'm going to request them because of the responses I have seen in the chat group to mentor at least one young lawyer, not from your country. We are now promoting the East African community. We are promoting cross-border practice. We want to be very practical. We will anyone who is interested in this mentorship we will take the first six emails that will be addressed to the ceo of the east african law society so the first six emails will be considered number two young lawyers watch out we are now introducing the young lawyers mentorship program where you'll be given at least one between one to two months to practice in a law firm not in your jurisdiction again we are promoting cross-border practice and we are looking out for young lawyers. Number three, special sessions that, I have, that have been requested for, for example, mergers, acquisition, the private equity, venture capital, and all these other special sessions that you'd want are going to be done under the committees. So if you have applied to be a member of the committee, the committees are going to take up 
webinars to do with specializations. So if you specialize in construction law, watch out for the webinars that will be organized by the committee on construction law. That is the way we are going to build our practices. Lastly, but not least, allow me to thank, first of all, our panelists, Mr. Daudi Mpanga, who also mentored me, um, but I'll share one story in 10 seconds. When I was a clerkship student at, uh, it was, by that time it was called AF Mpanga, I went into the office with a white shirt with a black tie. He may not remember this. He told me never put on a black tie. Ever since that day, don't put on a black tie. So, so the mentoring was also in terms of dressing and in terms of what you needed to do for your client. So he may, he may, not, he may not remember that, but that's one of the things he told me. Okay. Um, I would like to thank Ambassador Snari. From your meetings in Washington, we are now here. Thank you for that foresight, for the vision. We are now pushing the boundaries and, and, and I'm sure the young lawyers are committed to taking this society to the next level. That is our commitment to you so that we shall not let you down. President Emeritus Richard Mugisha, thank you so much for sparing the time to speak to our young lawyers. We are still implementing your strategic plan. The members have requested us when we're elected that they want to see value. We have heard you and we are getting back to you. I hope that you are impressed with so far the work that is being done. I can see that the numbers for this webinar, we had over 500 people registered. I think due to time and other issues, we've had a peak of almost 250 people. So that is a very good number. And the webinar is also on Facebook. You can actually go back and follow it if you missed any session and listen to the uh, inspiring words that were given by our panelists. Um, President Emeritus Omar Sayyid, first of all, congratulations. Uh, you're, now, you're now into politics. We will definitely um, use your hand when we need you. And uh, we are very grateful to the appointing authority for having considered you. Of course, between you and, uh, and our Deputy Secretary General Masood, you will pay commission to ELS for advertising your firm to young lawyers. Um, and, 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 and choosing and telling us how you are both the right partners. Okay. Um, Ms. Harriet Chigai, thank you so much. You founded the Young Lawyers Forum at the East African Law Society. We are building on that foundation and we continue to build on it so that we can inspire more lawyers. Mr. Clever Nigarura, thank you so much from Burundi. Thank you for the work that you're doing with Blue Bear and Company Advocates. Thank you so much. Um, we've definitely, sh you've definitely shared on how we can build our practices. We are very grateful. I would like also to thank the Secretariat. Thank you so much for putting together this webinar and also thank my co-moderator, Mr. Masood Salim for doing an excellent job. I had to take up from him because I knew if I had given him another chance we could have left at 5 p.m. So I had to take up from him to ensure that we finish on time. Thank you so much to all the participants and attendees. Please look out for the next session. Every month we are going to have a session focusing on young, web, on young lawyers. And I think the next one is on, do you specialize or generalize? That is a debate, that's an ongoing debate that has been uh, among young lawyers. And we're going to bring you a panel of people to discuss, those who have specialized and those who haven't. They should be able to share their experiences with you. Thank you so much. And let me wish you all a nice early weekend. Today is Thursday and wishing you the best. Have a, a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>